It's no secret that the U.S. is in the middle of a serious opioid crisis. Alarmingly high rates of overdose deaths have elicited calls to action at all levels. In this section of the presentation, we will provide background information on opioids, both prescribed and illicit, explore what happens when someone develops a substance use disorder, and examine how overprescribing is contributing to the problem. Let's first review opioids themselves. Opioids are a class of drugs that interact with nerve cells to reduce pain. They include pain relievers available by prescription, such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, and morphine, as well as the illegal drug heroin. Heroin use has increased across the U.S. among men and women, most age groups, and all income levels. You've probably heard of fentanyl as well. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid pain reliever. It is 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine and was developed for treating severe pain, typically advanced cancer pain. Illegal production and distribution of fentanyl have been on the rise in several states and have contributed to an alarming number of overdose deaths. People in the U.S. have been using opioids for pain relief for centuries. Opium made its way to the states prior to the Revolutionary War and morphine followed soon after its discovery in the 1800s. During the Civil War, a large amount of morphine was imported as a way to treat soldiers on the battlefield. It became so popular that it led to high levels of dependence and addiction for soldiers and civilians alike. In the late 1800s, Bayer actually began producing heroin as an over-the-counter, non-addictive cough suppressant alternative to morphine. Despite awareness of the harm these drugs were causing, they continued to be used and prescribed. It wasn't until 1924 that Congress actually made heroin illegal. And how are they used now? Prescription opioids are classified as controlled substances, which means their legal use is subject to regulation and restriction by the federal government. It also means prescribing them is highly regulated. They are prescribed most commonly to treat moderate to severe pain and are often prescribed following surgery or injury or for health conditions such as cancer. In recent years, there has been a dramatic increase in the acceptance and use of prescription opioids for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain, such as back pain or osteoarthritis, despite serious risks and lack of evidence about their long-term effectiveness. So what's the big deal about these prescriptions? Why do we consider opioids dangerous? Well, they are generally safe when taken for a short time and as prescribed, but because they produce euphoria in addition to pain relief, they can be misused, either taken in a different way or in a larger quantity than prescribed, or taken without a provider's prescription. And even if taken as prescribed, regular use can lead to dependence and tolerance, meaning higher and higher amounts of the drug are needed in order to achieve effects. Dependence and tolerance are not necessarily indicative of addiction or opioid use disorder, but are common symptoms and should be monitored carefully. Opioid use disorder is a serious risk as well. Patients with an opioid use disorder are invariably taking high quantities of opioids. And one of the dangers there is that opioids can cause slowed breathing, which can lead to hypoxia, a condition that results when too little oxygen reaches the brain. Hypoxia can have short and long-term psychological and neurological effects, including coma, permanent brain damage, or death. Opioids are especially dangerous when mixed with benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are central nervous system depressants used to sedate, induce sleep, prevent seizures, and relieve anxiety. Examples include alprazolam, or Xanax, diazepam, or Valium, and lorazepam, or Ativan. Providers should avoid prescribing opioids if the patient is taking benzodiazepines whenever possible, and vice versa. Many of us have an addiction of some kind. What makes addiction to heroin so much worse than addiction to sex or ice cream? Mostly, it's the physical risk. While you can cause physical harm to yourself by eating too much chocolate, it isn't nearly as dangerous as taking too much heroin. 
When making a diagnosis of addiction or substance use disorder, you use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which says, Opioid use disorder, or OUD, is the problematic pattern of opioid use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress and requires diagnosticians to identify at least two problematic behaviors from a list of 11 during a 12-month period. These behaviors include things like having a craving for opioids, spending a lot of time trying to obtain opioids, or failing to fulfill major obligations at work. To help clarify some of the terms we use, addiction is considered the severe end of the substance use disorder spectrum, which runs from mild to severe. An opioid use disorder is just one example of a substance use disorder. You can have different use disorders depending on what substance is being used, but the criteria will be the same. The American Society of Addiction Medicine issued a definition of addiction a few years ago. It says, Addiction is a treatable, chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. The important point here is that addiction is treatable and chronic. As with any treatment protocol that requires behavior change, patients may relapse, and if they do, it's not a failure, it's part of the process. Anyone taking opioids can become addicted to them, even if legally prescribed. This occurs in a quarter of all primary care patients receiving long-term opioid treatment. Physical dependence and feelings of euphoria make it very difficult to stop taking them. Patients may also develop a tolerance to an opioid's effects, leading them to need increasing amounts to produce the same results. It becomes an addiction when their use causes significant impairment or distress in their lives, and yet they are unable to stop using. Here's an example of a path that might lead a patient to addiction. Let's watch a quick video about one woman's story. They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Opioid use disorder is very serious, and it's affecting so many people in our communities now. In 2018, 9.9 .9 million people misused prescription opioids. That is roughly the entire population of the state of Michigan. It is important to screen all patients for substance use disorder with a validated screening tool. An opioid use disorder can have serious implications for a patient's overall health and impact the safety and effectiveness of their treatment plan. Screening can be done in every healthcare setting, but may look different in different practices. For example, you may have more time to go in-depth with a patient in a family practice than you would in an emergency room setting. To make sure you're prepared, familiarize yourself with the specific protocols and tools available at your practice. The National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, offers many free, web-based screening tools that you can take a look at. Two on the screen here are the NIDA Modified Assist and the TAPS tool, both available through drugabuse.gov. So you have a patient who is screened positive. Now what? How do you help them? Opioid use disorder is best treated through a combination of behavioral therapies and medication such as buprenorphine, naltrexone, and methadone. It is a chronic, relapsing condition that may require multiple rehabilitation attempts. All providers should understand the appropriate treatment methods, whether you plan to specialize in addiction or not. AAPA and the PA Foundation offer several courses to help students and providers learn more about these conditions.
Let's now look at overdoses more closely and talk about how prescribing might play a part. A few statistics. 130 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. You are now more likely to die from opioids than in a car crash. It has become a leading cause of death in the United States. The most common drugs involved in prescription opioid overdose deaths include oxycodone, such as oxycontin, methadone, and hydrocodone, such as Vicodin. You might be surprised to see methadone on this list because you've likely heard of it in reference to treating opioid addiction. That's what methadone clinics are for. However, it is also prescribed for pain management. Methadone accounts for 1% of all opioids prescribed for pain, but accounted for 23% of prescription opioid deaths in 2014. Because it can remain in a person's system long after the pain-relieving benefits have been exhausted, it can cause slow or shallow breathing and dangerous changes in heartbeat that might not be perceived by the patient. Oxycodone is on this list because it can be crushed, metabolizing the long-acting active opiate all at once. Hydrocodone is prescribed frequently and then often distributed as a common street drug, resulting in many overdose deaths. We mentioned earlier that the opioid epidemic really started with a rise in prescriptions in the 1990s. You can see how the light blue line for commonly prescribed opioids takes off from that point. And then, looking at the orange line, we see that around 2011, deaths from heroin began to rise. Then, following the teal line, we see that in about 2013, deaths from synthetic opioids like fentanyl really take off. What this is showing is the progression of the crisis. It started slowly with an increase in legal prescriptions. As more and more people were prescribed opioids, you see that the heroin and fentanyl lines stayed low. However, it stands to reason that after a few years, a significant number of people became addicted to those prescription opioids. If their providers cut them off or the medications became too expensive, for example, many people turned to heroin as an easier or more potent option. So heroin deaths began to rise, and not too long after, someone discovered that it takes a lot less fentanyl to get the same effect, and things just exploded. The reason fentanyl became popular is the same reason it's so deadly. It only takes an amount about the size of a grain of rice to kill an adult human. Drug dealers began lacing all kinds of drugs with fentanyl to make them more potent. Patients who either didn't know any better or who were very desperate ended up taking a much, much higher dose of opioids than they could handle and overdosed easily. So we've seen the effects that prescribing opioids can have on a patient, both good and bad. Now let's learn a bit more about prescribing patterns across the U.S. More than 191 million opioid prescriptions were dispensed to American patients in 2017, with wide variations across states. Healthcare providers in the highest prescribing state, Alabama, wrote almost three times as many prescriptions per person as those in the lowest prescribing state, Hawaii. The highest overdose death rates from prescription opioids were in West Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, and Utah. Studies suggest that regional variation in use of prescription opioids cannot be explained by the underlying health status of the population. Residents of Alabama are not just in three times as much pain as residents of Hawaii. As of 2020, 26 states limit opioid prescriptions. Another seven states direct health or medical agencies to set opioid prescribing limits. Two states, Rhode Island and Utah, do both. The remainder do not have any limits on how many opioids can be prescribed. You'll notice there is some overlap with the high overdose data. We don't have any causal data on the impact of prescription limits but you can certainly start to see some trends emerge. But who is doing the prescribing? The research shows that primary care providers account for about half of the prescriptions. Primary care includes family practice, internal medicine, osteopathic medicine, and general practice providers. The other half is everyone else combined, 
This makes sense because you can assume primary care providers are seeing the most patients and are typically the first stop for someone in pain. To fully address the opioid epidemic, we need to improve the way that we treat pain. Our goal is to help you be responsible prescribers so you can prevent misuse, addiction, and overdose before it's too late.